Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, here we go. And I will. Uh, uh, do you see the right screen now? Good. Okay. Thank you so much, Rose, for the introduction and Eden for the invitation and the contacts that we have. And, uh, also for uh, uh, being in this place is really uh, an honor for me. Um, I'm going to talk today about probing memory circuits in behaving primates and from single neuron to neural networks. Uh, let me start showing you this map of the world uh, in the context of this seminar. I'm going to show pictures of several personalities here. Probably some of you know them, uh, probably most of them. And uh, I'm gonna show it for a short period of time and you're gonna try to remember them. This is a mental exercise because I cannot interact with you, but you're gonna try to remember them and then uh, probably the places where I have shown it. Um, all right. You probably can remember a few of them. If you can see, I'm just gonna go over them and tell you a little bit about that. So here is, uh, um, uh, 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 in Canada, we have our, uh, the NDP actually, the head of the NDP party. Um, and we have Patricia Goldman Rakish, we have also John Lewis, we have Jose Marti, we have Tupac Amaro. And we have uh, Malala, we have uh, uh, Gandhi, we have Mandela, we have Erika Sasaki, Cajal, uh, we have uh, Marie Curie, and we have also Pablo. What I want to say to this is that probably you remember three or four of them because you're short-term memory. Short-term memory has a limited capacity. And you also remember probably a lot of them, and you know a lot about these people because you're long-term memory. And this represents, I can give you an example of how memory works, short-term memory and long-term memory work, and I'll also an example of human diversity. We are a diverse species, and also we might look different sometimes. Our brains are very similar, and we think in a very similar ways. So I'm going to talk about memory today. I'm gonna to give you a, a short definition of memory, which is the faculty by which the brain stores and remembers information. And I have the thing that I took from Toys R Us, and instead of Toys R Us, I say that memories are us. Memory defines actually who we are, um, the way that we think, uh, and, and, and how do we see the world. So memory is a very important uh, component of the human uh, uh, cognition. Uh, memory can be divided into sensory memory, iconic memory, uh, in this case, an example, short-term memory, which is uh, for about a few seconds, and long-term memory, which is uh, uh, that can last for days, months, etc. And I show you the difference between short-term memory and long-term memory. Short-term memory seems to be, actually has a limited capacity, while long-term memory seems to be something that is, uh, uh, it can last uh, for longer time. I'm going to talk today about short-term memory and long-term memory. These are the two different parts of the talk, which is kind of unusual. People that do memory research, I do one or the other. So I have tried to do both and to see, if, you tell me if that works or not. Um, so uh, in terms of, uh, let's start with short-term memory. Uh, there is a type of short-term memory that is called visual working memory, which is the maintenance and manipulation of visual information relevant to behavior for short time intervals, generally seconds. And the mechanics of short-term memory seem to be different from long-term memory, and I'm going to tell you why. But in general, short-term memory, this is activity-dependent mechanism that it lasts for a few seconds and then goes away. Long-term memory is that thing that gets stored in the synapses and actually can last forever. Um, so now, one of the questions that we had when we started uh, doing visual working memory was, which brain areas or circuits encode working memory? And um, one of the first experiments that was done in this, uh, um, uh, in this realm was by Jacobsen in 1936, at the beginning of the century, that used what is called the uh, Wisconsin test apparatus here on the left. The Wisconsin test, test apparatus is basically a, a box in which you can have a primate inside, and you have two cups. In one of the cups, you can hide food. Then you just lower a curtain so that the primate doesn't see where has to remember where the food was hidden, and then you open the curtain and the 
primate just reaches for the cup where the food is hit, actually. The important thing is that they have to maintain in memory for a certain amount of time this information. And this is the same thing when you remember a phone number or the name of someone and then you forgot after a few seconds. So when he did the lesion in prefrontal areas of three species of primates, uh, Rhesus monkey, the Cercocebus torquatus, and the Papio Papio, and reported a loss of working memory in a delayed response task, all of these animals are anthropoid primates. And actually, they do have the prefrontal cortex that is granular, uh, which is a, a structure that appears in anthropoid primates. From proxemians to anthropoid primates, the granular prefrontal cortex appears. So he does that, and the working memory is uh, basically impaired in these species. And therefore, people thought that the seed for working memory may be the prefrontal cortex. Now, in about the 1959, around that time, Hubel and Wiesel do, do the recording experiment in a way cats. And actually, they can record single units by going with an electrode here on the left, very close to a neuron. This is an electrode, this is a pair, actually, to get you the scales, and those are neurons. And um, by recording, um, by bringing the electrode there and refer to a, a point where the electrical potential is zero, where there is no change in voltage, you can record the action potentials of the neurons that is with some sort of digital code that is on and off that uh, uh, the brain uses to communicate one neuron with another and over long distances, actually. Um, there is also the synapse, but I am going one step higher here in terms of action potential, uh, uh, and that's the language that the system neurophysiology usually speaks. Um, now, Fuster, Joaquin Fuster in, uh, um, uh, in 1971 and Alexander, they used this version of the Wisconsin test apparatus, and they found that um, uh, if you record from neurons in the lateral prefrontal cortex, which is part of the cortex right anterior to the arcuate sulcus here, and around the principal, you can put an electrode there and you test the animal with the Wisconsin test apparatus. So you show the food in one of the cups and you lower during the delay period the screen. And then you have the response period uh, where the animal reaches for that. During the delay period of the task, it was this spiking activity of the neurons that was representing the location of the food. So this is what it was called sustained or persistent activity. And that represents the contents of working memory. So essentially, there are neurons that are only active when the animals remember that, uh, the, the, that the food was on the right side, and neurons that are active when they remember that the food was on the left side. These are what they call the neural correlates of working memory. And, um, and after that, there was a series of experiments by one of my heroes in, in research, Patricia goldman um, uh Patricia actually uh, recorded the activity from the same area of Joaquin Fuster, but what she did in this case was to um, uh, present an animal, a monkey, in front of a computer screen. And the animal has to remember one of these eight locations on the screen that appear here on the, um, on, on the right-hand side. And uh, when the animal was remembering the location all the way down at the bottom of the, of the image state, the cells were responding a lot. So basically, this what you see on the left-hand side down there is the uh, uh, peristimulus histogram of the spiking activity. Each line is a different trial, and the intensity of the spiking of the frequency of the spikes are uh, presented on the um, on the slide here. So on the um, uh, at the bottom in general. So uh, this is what is called a, a, a sustained activity, and uh, they has been described in in, in different studies. So. Parallel to that, uh, David Van Essen and Fallerman published this diagram, what is what I call it the subway system of the um, of the of the visual of, of the macaque visual cortex, in which you can have different brain areas from the bottom to the top. You start on the retina, then LGN, and you go through different stages of processing, and all the way on top of the hierarchy is the hippocampus. So the hippocampus actually uh, integrates information at that level, and then you have areas like area 46, for example, in the prefrontal cortex, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the, the big question uh, uh, when we started uh, recording was, it is working in memory fully distributed, or is this just a function of the subset of brain areas? You may think that all brain areas may have the properties to encode working memory. 
of that this is just a function of a subset of brain areas. In the experiments that I'm going to, uh, to show here today, I'm going to talk about the areas there in red um, and the hippocampus in green. For short-term memory experiments, I'm going to talk about area 46, MST, and area MT. Area MT is an early visual area that receives mainly visual inputs and um, process motion. MSTD also process motion, but also receive other inputs like vestibular inputs. So it's an association area. And area 46 is what we call an executive area of the brain. It's all the way in the frontal cortex. So in this set of experiments, we um, um, train a monkey uh, to do the following task. Uh, there is a fixation point in the middle of the screen on, all the way on the top and the animal has to fixate this dot for 470 milliseconds. Then you show a sample, which is a random dot pattern actually moving up. It's, uh, it's a cloud of dot moving up. The animal is keeping the fixation constant. And then you have a delay period. And during the delay period, you have um, um, the, the animal has to remember the direction of motion of the sample. And then you have several test periods happening 500 milliseconds uh, apart. Uh, last for 500 milli, 590 milliseconds, and then you have uh, intervals and 500 milliseconds, and the animal has to release a liver when actually, uh, when this, the test matches the sample. It's called a delay match to sample test. What did we find when we record from different areas of the, of the macaque visual cortex? We put our electrodes in area MT, which is an early visual area, area MST, which is an association area, and then the lateral prefrontal cortex that is all the way um, um, in, the, in the front of the brain. And what we found was very interesting. When you go to area MT and you look at the, um, the, the responses of neurons to the sample, what you see in these graphs is the firing rate on the y-axis and time in the x-axis. And you have the responses to the sample um, uh, as a spike density function, which is some kind of integration of these uh, 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 histo uh, histograms of spikes that I show you. And what you see is that this neuron during the sample period responds differently to the different motion directions. This is what we call a tuned neuron for motion direction. But during the delay period, it's silent. When the animal was remembering which motion direction was in the display, the, the neuron was completely silent. Now, if you go to area MST, it's a completely different story. There are cells that they represent the motion direction during the sample period and during the delay period. So MST cells, if you want to consider like that, they're remembering what the animal had in, 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 in mind during the delay period. And if you go to the lateral prefrontal cortex, it was the same thing. Remember, this is by density functions because they have different uh, 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 intensity of firing, it means that they can discriminate between the different motion directions. It's not that the cell was just firing, it's that the cell gives more spikes to one motion direction than to the others and to the others. So this is called selectivity. This was published already and we uh, basically found that in these uh, sensory areas we don't find traces of working memory. This is kind of a summary. Uh, in, the summary in the summary we find the robust working memory coding in executive areas, um, we have robust working memory coding association areas, uh, but not as robust and correlated with performance as, as in, in executive areas. And in, in sensory areas, we have basically poor working memory coding. So this work was done by uh, Diego and, uh, and, um, and Matthew and many other people in the lab. Uh, I just have to mention before I move that we thought that from MT to MST was some sort of transition in cortical architecture in the operations of the circuits that produce this, this kind of activity. These are, um, oh, sorry, I, I want to show Matt and Diego pictures because uh, that was, uh, let's get there. There is Matt and Diego. Diego is a student from Colombia, and Matt is uh, from California, from here, from California. Well, not from there, from California. Uh, that's, um, that was really uh, very interesting work that they did together. So what are the features of cortical microcircuits that vary across sensory and association and executive areas? What we thought is that the primary neocortex may not be that homogeneous thing. When we think about the cortex, we think these six cortical layers in the neocortex with the same neurons, same thing. Well, there is some wiring that actually determines things that 
may be different, different operation, but it's all in the wiring and the connectivity. But is that true? So one of the things that we do, we did, was to look at the, some models of um, uh, working memory circuits that are proposed by Xiao Jing Wang. Uh, what you have in this diagram, in gray, there is the pyramidal cells uh, with apical dendrites, so different dendritic compartments. And uh, these different pyramidal cells in the different columns, what they do is that they encode different locations in the visual field. Let's say that you will remember different locations in the visual field for a spatial working memory task. You have the parvovolin cell, which is usually the classical basket cell. Uh, there are other PV cells, but the classical one is the basket cells that what it does is receive inputs from these pyramidal cells and actually inhibit cells that they have different orientation or different coding, different selectivity from that. And now you have another type of uh, cells, which is the calretinin cell and the calbindin cells, which are coming from the mouse work. The calretinin cells positive cell is an interneuron that is kind of equivalent to the VIP cell. So it's a cell that produces inhibition of inhibition. So that cells actually inhibit mostly the calbindin cell, which is kind of an equivalent of the SST cell. And actually, and the SST cell inhibit the apical dendrites of the, uh, or in the in, inhibit the dendritic trees of the pyramidal cell. So let me show here the kind of uh, segregated the circuit. We have the pyramidal cell, the PV. The PV actually uh, projects to the calretinin and the calbindin, as so well the pyramidal cells. But the main uh, thing to, to remember here is that um, the calretinin cells could facilitate pyramidal cell activation by inhibiting the calbindin cells. So if you're thinking in the recurrent network, if you are, inputs are coming through the dendritic tree, you will have to inhibit that can building cells so that you can have the inputs, recurrent inputs coming into that. And the, uh, the PV actually inhibits pyramidal cells uh, nearby. So um, we had the hypothesis that it was an increase in the ratio of calretinin to PV that may favor excitatory inputs integration and recurrent activation in associative cortical pyramidal neurons. So basically, if you have an increase in calretinin, the calbindin cell is not inhibited the, the pyramidal cell that much. And then pyramidal cells can go into some kind of recurrent loops of interactions. And those are basically the predominant models of working memory. And it was a decrease in PV. And that may be related to the ability of prefrontal cortex, let's say, to produce this uh, persistent firing, but not MT. MT may be have too much PV to too little calretinin and vice versa. The what we did, we did a small histology experiment in which actually we sectioned these different areas in the macaque monkey. What you see here is just um, uh, a section across the prefrontal cortex to look at, and you have here in gray the, uh, the actual um, uh, uh, the LPFC around the, the principal sulcus. And in, uh, in the temporal lobe, you have MST and MT. The good thing about MST and MT is that you can fit them in one slide. So you could do really the histology there. Down here, you're showing the, um, uh, um, so the DAPI to, to locate layer four. And I'm just gonna show quickly this data. So what we have here is some antibody staining for PV and calretinin, and we can actually quantify the different layers. And we'd also did some neurogranin staining, staining for the pyramidal cells. And um, this is just to show you that the staining works pretty well with the antibodies that we have. And, um, and what we found was that indeed, it was uh, 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 a decrease in the PV to calretinin ratio when you go from, M from MT to MST to LPFC. And on the left, you have the different ratios. And on the right, you have the actual uh, percentage that we did cell counts in this case. Uh, so to summarize, there is an increase uh, in calretinin relative to uh, PV in these higher areas, mainly in the prefrontal cortex relative to MT. So here to summarize, what we found is that uh, we have an increase in the proportion of PVs in visual uh, in MT and relative decrease in calretinin cells and vice versa in the prefrontal cortex. And our hypothesis is that this may actually favor recurrent activation of uh, and persistent firing. Now, this was the work of Jackson uh, uh, Blond and Santiago. Jackson is a Canadian native from Ontario. Santiago is a Colombian from Bogota. So I have a lot of students from Colombia in the lab. <laughs>
So um, uh, we have uh, uh, Kelly Bullock is a, a, a native from Texas that did actually a, um, a master with me. Uh, Kelly is also a very talented artist. So she's here now in Ontario and she has her own company and what she does is graphic design and she actually illustrates the gradient of these cells in the neocortex. Here you see in red, this is the actual decal retinin cell and in green, this is a parvovolumin cell. And what you see is that there is this gradient in the neocortex in the animal and uh, we got the, the cover of cerebral cortex with this, um, um, but uh, you get the point. In that the, cort the cortex of these primates is about gradient in a lot. And what, do what, what does it mean is not very clear, but, um, but that's what we found. So then we ask another interesting question. We started talking to past planner physiologists and they start taking me, it's all intrinsic properties. I mean, it just may be that you just hit a cell with a past planner, a prefrontal cell with a, with a current, and actually the cell keeps just firing for a few seconds. And there is your working memory. And there is publications in that uh, uh, realm too, uh, especially in rodents uh, and with manipulation of some form with some pharmacology. But we did a very simple experiment. We said maybe the, the prefrontal cell is special and then you actually hit it with a, a, a pulse of current and it keeps spiking. And that's the way that you keep your memory. And that has nothing to do with the network. It has something to do with the intrinsic properties of the cell, uh, or maybe not. So, and the experiments that you can set up here, you can uh, isolate a prefrontal cell, you can actually patch it, and then you can deliver this input, which is this square pulse that you can see here, uh, into the cell, and then you can measure the train of action potentials after the cell, uh, uh, after you stop the, 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 pulse, the pulse of current. Of course, you can also block uh, synaptic activity, and you have two hypotheses. Either the cell keeps firing or the cell doesn't keep firing. When you stop the input, the cell stops firing. So we did uh, some sliced experiments in the prefrontal cortex. These are some of the illustrations and some of the pictures in the patch clan. I wasn't used to this picture. For me, it was like, like the, the moon, the surface of the moon, but I have gotten more and more used to patches and, and it is a very interesting thing. Um, so we recorded from the left emitters. We put it, uh, the slices um, uh, and block synaptic transmissions. And then we did this experiment in, in a good sample of neurons. And I'm going to show you some examples here. This is an example cell. And what you see on the top is basically the current pulse. We use a square pulse, which is the same protocol as the Allen Institute has. Then in the middle, you have traces of patch clamp. This is the fastest spiking cell. So it's very hard that you see anything here in the middle one in all this green, but it said the cell was firing hot and it wasn't adapted. And at the bottom, you have actually uh, the rasters, which uh, tells you that the cell fires a lot when you are stimulating, but as soon as you stop the simulation, the cell stops firing. This cell was a little bit different, actually. When you have uh, uh, pulses, uh, square pulses, which is depolarizations on the ones that are positive, uh, you get this spiking activity, but you don't get anything when the pulse ceases. Now, if you hyperpolarize the cell, you get this rebound spiking activity at the end in the second row there. And this rebound spiking activity is actually uh, uh, due to, to probably some rebound spike from the depolarization. And now you have the, uh, the, the rasters down there. And you have this cell that was a very rare cell, but it was a cell that you, uh, in some of these square pulses, these cells actually keep firing and they fire for a certain time after you discontinue the pulse. Nevertheless, um, I don't want to get uh, the hopes very high. This is only 5% of the cell, and there were very few that had this behavior. So we really didn't, we don't think that intrinsic properties are accounting for that, at least not just for the polarizing pulses that the cells keep going. So this work was done in collaboration with uh, Walter Inoue. This is Julia and Sarah, two wonderful students that they, they know how to find. So, all right. So the whole idea was that persistent firing results from network dynamics. And one of the things that we wanted to test is those network dynamics in a little bit more uh, depth. And now we started doing something that we call the ketamine trials by looking at this uh, pyramidal cell, PV cell interactions and working on the coding. And um, just to, to, to explain a little bit about this, this is just a picture of Goldman Rakesh, one of the recordings, I'm sorry, Funahashi, 
uh, was actually uh, uh, worked together with Perlman Rakesh. And what you see in this cell is that uh, the preferred location of this cell is what happened in this system on the left, uh, on the left uh, uh, hand side of the histogram. Um, so this cell was more responsive when the animal was remembering uh, this location uh, on the left and on the upper quadrant. Um, now, if we were to actually to look at a profile of activity in the prefrontal cortex of this animal, we probably will see something like that, a Gaussian function that is around location two, which is a location that the animal may be remembering, and the other locations that the, the curve just goes flat. So basically, this is what we call it tuning for working memory. Now, uh, the whole idea that Goldman Rakesh and uh, um, Xiaojing Wang uh, uh, proposed was that there is this network of excitatory pyramidal cells, those triangles on top, and these excitatory pyramidal cells actually um, produce this um, uh, active, this, this uh, uh, profiles of activity because they have, uh, they are recording networks connected that they actually encode one of these locations. And um, you have a PV cell that actually receives inputs, let's say for prefers to location, and that inhibits the cells with the other uh, location. In this case, you have this kind of a Gaussian profile uh, due to the excitation of the pyramidal cells and the inhibition of nearby uh, other group of pyramidal cells by uh, 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 inhibitory interneurons, the PV interneurons. By the way, I just want to mention that we consider the pyramidal cell as the cell that uh, gets information out of the cortex in most of the cases. Interneurons, they're more local operators in this case. Nevertheless, they're very important for, for activity. Yeah. So um, uh, in this case, we... Hold on, I'm a little... Uh, I have to... Something happened here. Uh, not sure. Um, give me a minute here. Sorry, I, I have my presentation kind of froze here, and I'm trying to solve the problem. Okay, here it is. All right. I see the pyramidal cell. Okay, here it is. Uh, I'm going back. There we go. And now we have, uh, let me just go back. Just uh, what we thought with the ketamine trials was that we can actually tap into these uh, synapses between the pyramidal cell and the, uh, and the part of woman interneuron. And these synapses are very rich in a certain type of an MDA receptor, the gluon 2 c subunits. And we, ketamine in low doses may actually act selectively on these type of subunits. So if we give ketamine in low doses uh, to an animal, we may be able to selectively impair that actual part of that uh, actual synaptic transmission. And we could have very predictive effects in that. In this case, what we predict is that the pyramidal cells are going to be uh, uh, losing their tuning of the population by uh, decreasing the inhibition of the pyramidal cells because the cells that are not selective for location two would actually uh, uh, increase the, the, um, uh, the response. I hope that that's clear. So we also took advantage of the ability of macaques to, uh, to, to uh, drive in virtual environments, basically a joystick. This is Theo, and Theo is going through a corridor, and Theo is doing uh, this uh, matching the color of this square to, uh, the, to the color of the other target, so it's a match to sample. But the task that we have for Theo was a little bit different. The task that we have, we show um, a, a, an arena. Theo was in front of the computer screen, and when we show the arena, um, uh, generally sitting in this uh, green point in front of the arena. And there is like nine different locations that we can show a target. And at these nine different locations, we will see, uh, uh, we can show a target, make the target disappear, and then wait for the animal. We lock the animal in the, in the, in the podium, and then we let it, let it go, and then he can match the location of the target. Let me show you a video that is gonna be much better. So Theo is sitting on the podium now, there we lock him, virtually, 
and now he goes, reaches the location and gets a reward. Same thing happens now. Now he has to remember where it is. Now he goes there and then he reaches the reward. So that's the task for the animal. Um, in this task, we have three different uh, um, uh, periods, the queue, the delay, and the response. Importantly, during the delay period, the animal has to remember the location of the queue. And uh, we call that encoding delay and response. And this was our small, our little ketamine trial. What we did was we did uh, injections at time zero. The injection could be saline or ketamine. Then we have false injection trials. Uh, uh, in which actually we uh, documented the effect of the injection. And then we have late post injection trials. By the way, I should say that these animals are trained to give you the, uh, the leg uh, uh, voluntarily for the ketamine and you give them a reward uh, when, they, when you give them the injection. So it's a, it's a lengthy process. It's hard, but you could do it. Um, these are the, the the implants that we did in the lateral prefrontal cortex close to the arcuate sulcus. So these are matrices of 10 by 10 electrodes that you can record hundreds of cells at the same time in the prefrontal cortex. And I'm showing you one example of the behavior of the animal. The animal is started at the position, at the black position, and the trajectories are in green, and it hits this pink uh, position on the, on the arena. We're looking at the arena from the top. Now, when you give pediments, they get pretty lost. They start just going around in the arena and they can actually uh, look into, they kind of lose themselves in the arena. And then after the late post injection, they start recovering and they start hitting the target again. So it seems to be that the working memory is not working. So, and um, these are the behavioral data, the, percent, the percentage of correct responses on the left. And uh, here, uh, uh, the time to reach the target on the right. And we have those effects in ketamine relative to safe. We also give injections of saline in some traps. Now, this is an example cells. On top, the pre-injection tuning, the early post-injection, and the late post-injection. And I will actually um, probably ask you to focus on the surfaces. The surfaces tells you the tuning of the cell for the remember location. Uh, what you have is just a little uh, maze there, but the, the tuning appears right in, the, uh, in yellow is the, the maximal response. And what you see is that on top, on the top surface, the cell is responding at this location that is on the left when the animal leaves the mess, to the left right down there. And in the middle, the, the, the whole tuning gets flat. And then it recovers again. So the cell loses the tuning after ketamines and it recovers again. And that, that actually makes sense because we saw that in the behavior of the animal, the same thing. When you look at the number of cells that they lost tuning with ketamine, what I would ask you to, uh, to look in here is basically that this pie graph has contracted, which is the number of cells that they were tuned for their location, uh, they decrease uh, quite a bit uh, with ketamine. So uh, the other ones are the pre-injection and the late post-injection. But uh, importantly, um, we divided the cells into broad and narrow spikes. What you see on the left is all the cells plot on top of each other. And we classify the cells in narrow spiking uh, um, according to these uh, uh, histograms in the middle. So we plot all the cells and we fit it with a two dimension, with two Gaussian, the sum of two Gaussians, where the Gaussians intersect right where the dashed line is, is uh, everything to the left is narrow spiking, everything to the right is uh, uh, broad spiking. Now what you see all the way on the right is the, a, a, a histogram of transgenic cell types from the Allen Institute in which we show, and I can talk more about this, is that the most of the broad spiking cells are actually pyramidal, and a lot of the narrow spiking cells, specifically the most narrow spiking ones, are PV cells in red here, PV positive cells. And the, the place that we were recording in layers two and three, that's where we found more PV cells than any, any other place during histology. I can expand on that later, but you have to take my word that the, uh, the, the narrow spiking are putative PV cells and the broadest spike in as putative pyramidal neurons. So now when we look at the narrow spike in and we look at the tuning for the prefer and anti-prefer direction, which is basically during this shaded, in this sh uh, shaded area, you see this tuning. What you can see is that the preferred direction in green here is very high and that the prefer in, in purple is very low. But after you get ketamine, which is actually the dashed lines, the two things collapse and they become this uh, 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 line. 
and but the broad the broad spike in cell is different. It doesn't collapse. It's actually the anti-preferred direction, which is the dash purple line, goes up. So it's getting flattened up in a different way. The the PV cell is getting flattened down. The other one is actually going up and losing the tumor. The broad spike in cell. And I would like to illustrate like that here. This is exactly what has happened to the tuning of these cells. And that was our hypothesis, that you are going to make the, the PV cell less responsive, and therefore the tuning of the pyramidal cell is going to be affected. So to end up this part, uh, we find that ketamine decreases the population tuning for its spatial working memory, uh, and uh, decreases the response of putative PV cells, and increases responses of putative pyramidal cells. I'm a little bit actually um, with time here, but I'm going to try to wrap up the next part in 10, 15 minutes. Um, now we have, uh, this was work with Lena Polanyapan, who is a psychiatrist, and Megan Roussy, that they actually uh, were our collaborators. Let me talk a little bit about long-term memory, because I know that some of you might be uh, um, expecting me to talk about this. And um, this is... Will, will the pencil? And it the brain under local anesthesia. Let me just uh, get the video. It is a useful tactical procedure to stimulate the cortex electrically. These are not experiments. In that process, we have stumbled quite accidentally on the fact that there is recorded in the nerve cells of the human brain a complete record of the stream of consciousness. All right, so this is what the Prefel uh, telling about the existential experience experiments when he stimulates the hippocampus of the the temporal lobe of the patient and they find uh, these, uh, uh, that the patient tells about these experiences. And um, that was the beginning at the Montreal Neurological Institute and uh, a wonderful uh, colleague and um, example um, and role model, Brenda Milner, did these experiments. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to Brenda always. Uh, what they look at this patient HM in which it has uh, uh, a bilateral remover of the hippocampus because of epilepsy surgery. And uh, what he found, what she found was that she, the patient couldn't form actually new memory. There is more detail to that what happened and it's, it's definitely uh, uh, nailing the associative memory part of the memory system. But that's what Brenda found. Uh, on the other hand, in 1971 71 or now 1970s, O'Keefe also does experiments in which he finds that when a rat uh, um, is at a certain position in the maze, actually you can find um, uh, activity of certain cells that are activated at a certain position in the maze, those are complex cells. Um, we decided to start studying the hippocampus and long-term memory, and then we we had this decision to make whether going with rodents or going into the primates, and we were looking a little bit at the anatomy of these uh, uh, different things, and things have changed a little bit from the rodent hippocampus to the primate hippocampus. The fields are still the same, what you see down here in the lower uh, uh, row, but it's still the hippocampus has rotated, and the brain has grown a little bit in the prefrontal cortex, there's new connections, there are even new cell types that have appeared in primates. So we decided that we are going to explore the primate hippocampus also because there is a lot of people working in mouse hippocampus and we have learned a lot from that kind of uh, And we had a question, basically the first question was, can we reconcile this spatial navigation that O'Keefe had as a hippocampus as a GPS and the memory view of the hippocampus as a, as a memory device that Brenda had. Um, um, basically, we asked a very simple question. How does a uh, mnemonic coding of a space and visual features interact in the hippocampus uh, during virtual navigation tasks? Uh, two people that were influential in this work was uh, Eichenbaum, that unfortunately he passed away. He gave us a lot of good advice. And someone that you have here in UC Davis, and you recognize the other person there, and uh, he gave us a pretty good advice uh, when we were doing that and we kept actually uh, asking experiments. We went into this field uh, like, like really uh, out of curiosity and, and because that was the thing to do. So this is just a, um, 
some of the things that we have we can do in the in the monkey we can do navigation actually that's the way that we target the hippocampus in these primates here in green you have the hippocampus and then we do uh, similar certain procedures to target them but what i want to say that in these experiments we target the central hippocampus the medial part of the hippocampus um, probably area CA3 and CA1, that's the things that, that we target the most in our experiments. Uh, we produce a virtual reality maze with a mountain, trees, and this was a maze in which the animal was navigating. And the animal was sitting in front of a computer task, uh, of a computer screen, and the task for the animal in one task was just navigating the maze, which is basically to go around the maze and actually hunt for these um, uh, red shadows. Uh, that's just a foraging task, or we call it a foraging task. You can see the responses of the neurons there. So. And in the second task, the animal was uh, going through the maze, but he has to do something different. According to the color of the walls, now you will see the walls now, they are going to turn gray. At the end, when the animal gets to the end of the maze, uh, he's going to see two targets. And depending on the color of the walls, the animal has to choose the green target or the orange target. Now we're going to go back again and we will see actually the wood and when it is wood the animal has to reverse the choice that they made before and instead of going to the green target it has to go to the orange target. So it's a contextual uh, associative memory task. So what did we find here? Well what we found is that in the foraging task on the top row there were very little spikes in this first cell that we're plotting here. What we're plotting is the, the raster uh, in individual trials, and on the left is the configuration of the maze. Uh, where well, you see that when the associative memory task happened, uh, there was a lot of spikes in actually in the, in the extremes of the maze, in these open areas of the maze, so, uh, or the branching of the maze. So uh, in this second cell example, we found that there were, in the foraging task, firing a lot in the middle, but they were firing all over the place when they go to the associative memory. And when we quantify that, and we use actually spatial information content to quantify what you see here at the bottom in these different colors is the different segment of the, of the, of the maze by the contours, the colors of the contours are on top, is that uh, there were kind of place fields in all areas of the maze homogeneous between for aging, but during the associative memory task, there were these things emerging everywhere, like if you were like place fields, what people might call place fields emerging in different places, uh, parts of the maze. They may not be place fields, it may be something else, but I'm going to refer to that. So basically, we found same neuron, different task, different spatial coding. So why is that? So what we thought is that these neurons are also selected for features. And what these neurons are representing is some actually convergence of object features and um, different uh, other uh, object features in space. And I'll probably try to to run a little bit uh, faster here. Um, and this is just uh, um, uh, the, what the animal does. We divided the maze into different portions according to where the animal is. Um, this is just a video to show you one trial. But um, let me, we divided the maze into post-trial stars. So on top, the, the animal starts on top and it starts in this uh, uh, red arrow. And when the animal gets a reward, it goes back, keeps navigating. Then when it hits actually the green, it sees the, uh, the context. Then when he gets to the light blue, uh, the object appears. And then in the dark blue, he has to approach the object. And we divided the maze into these different sectors of the maze. And what we did here was basically to uh, divide the maze into different sectors. Um, and basically what we do is to uh, analyze the trial n and the trial n plus one. Right, what we find at the bottom is a linear regression model, and what you find plotted on the y-axis is the proportion of cells that show coefficients in the linear regression that would encode either the context, the objects, or a combination of objects and context. What you see in those in the object approach parts and in the post-reward part, basically there is that the amount of cells that are encoding the context, the object, and the context plus object actually increases. So what happened is that exactly at this point, the cells are encoding these features of the objects. Now, in the object approach, is the encoding that prospectively? The animal sees the object, the hippocampus is encoding those object features, the cells are encoding that, 
Now, in the fox reward, the animal saw that it's going back, and what I think that the animal thinks is like, oh, that was wood, and it was uh, uh, orange and, and, and green, I have to choose orange. And that is why we think that this encoding is happening there, which is not surprising. The hippocampus has been involved in memory. So this was the work of Rob Gulley that did an incredible work, and Lyndon, and Ben, uh, and Guillaume. Uh, they run these very difficult experiments, and they actually did a, a great job doing this. Now, one of the questions that we had is, well, the animal is just sitting, it's going through the maze, it's navigating. Actually, what happens with coding of uh, 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 a real coding of the space, but the civil system is not engaged, right? The civil system is off, there is a lot of things that are not happening. What happens if the animal will be navigating through a maze, which is a little bit difficult to get a macaque monkey actually moving around with uh, 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 electrodes in the head and that kind of thing. So then we switch our attention to marmoset trials and there is Zach Davis that help, help, help us to actually to set up that um, uh, marmoset trials in the monkey. And I'm going to show you a couple of things that are interesting. This is our methods. So we got a marmoset and we fit the marmoset with a cap in the head. And in the cap, we have a chronic microwire recording, like the same thing that people use in mouse in the old times, but they have these microwires. Uh, and we can bring those microwires to the hippocampus. We can have a recording system that this activity is transmitted wireless. And in the cap that we put on top to cover the microwire, we can put more. And those markers, we can track it with a system, of a big camera system. And basically, we can record activity, not for one, but for two animals at a time, inside what we call the marmoset gym, which is a big plexiglass thing. And we can record the, the activity of neurons, and we can uh, manipulate the behavior of the animal. What you see here on the left side is that the animal actually going around the marmoset gym with the markers on the head, and on the right side, the different trajectories um, of, of the animal. So uh, you can see that we can map, we can have a pretty good map of the animal space. And the first question was whether we can find actually place cells in 3D in those animals, or the so-called place cells. Uh, I'm going to show you an example here of responses. Uh, here the animal, every red dot is an actual potential. This cell seems to like quite a bit when the animal is in this upper part of the chamber and is at those positions. Um, this is a single neuron isolated. And these are actually the place fields of, that anim of this animal. What you can see is that this cell has a place field here on top and another one in the middle uh, platform here. And uh, interesting, if you were to flatten that up, you will see just, oh, this cell has two place fields, so it looks like some sort of a grid cells or something like that, but in reality, it's a 3D cell. The other thing that we can do is to plot the gaze, the head direction of the animals as, uh, uh, into the, the walls of the maze. And to see these are visual animals, and it has been speculated that the hippocampus in, in animals like macaques, they have view cells. Basically, our cells that when you're looking at a certain location, actually, they get the fire rate. This is like place cells, but in kind of in, in a view space, in gaze space. So what we could do was project the animal gaze to, in this case, where I'm showing is on the left, four different locations that the animal is looking at because that's where, where the reward was in these kind of trials. And on the right, we say, well, we're not gonna give reward in these two diagonal locations, only in the other two. And the animal was looking at those two only. So we can project the gaze of the animal in the walls of the, and I can tell you details about the method on the wall of the gym and, and then to look at the, uh, whether there is gaze fields in this case. And this is an example of another cell. This also lies quite a bit when the animal is looking at, uh, at certain locations here, for example, it's firing quite a bit. Here is the animal, it doesn't move. The position of the animal is the same, it's just looking down, looking at different, and when the animal looks there, so indeed, we have a gaze field or a view cell, if you want to call it, uh, in, in this part of the chamber. So uh, these experiments, we are still experimenting with this, and, and, and it's a very exciting uh, venue. Um, but in general, I want to show you that we found that um, when we analyze the spatial information content of uh, what we call a view cells, um, or okay, gate cells, and the plate cells, actually the view cells, they have more spatial information content. So we could extract more information about where the animal is looking at than where the animal actually is in, in, in terms of uh, space from the hippocampus. And this is actually a... a, a 
just to tell you that these cells are not different. It's not that there is view cells and plague cells, so these cells overlap quite a bit. There is more view cells than plague cells, what we found, but they overlap quite a bit. So as a conclusion, the primary hypocampus encodes space, non-spatial features and their conjunctions, and it provides a context-specific map of the environment. Uh, and in the hippocampus, a spatial representation exists in 3D, and they're predominantly driven by gaze. That's what we found. And a strat this strategy may be as equated in a species such as primate with a sophisticated visual system. So I'm just going to um, uh, acknowledge on my lab. Yes, memories are us. This is uh, something that we actually uh, uh, keep uh, very dear to have all these people and all these students in the lab with us. And this is a list of our collaborators and people that we have actually uh, participated uh, in that. Mainly the ones on, on purple are the ones that they did the most work in the experiments that I show. So thank you very much. And I'm going to stop. I think I'm a little bit over time. Uh, I apologize for that. Oh. Awesome. Thank you so much, Julio. Um, OK, so if anyone has any questions, let's go ahead and put them in the chat. I think there are a couple questions I can ask you right now that were submitted during your talk. So Lindsay asked, oh, it's a double. Do these cells change tuning before, before or after ketamine administration, or do they go completely back to pre-administration tuning? Also, what dose of ketamine was used? This is a very interesting, but I don't want to give a compromising answer because we have the impression that sometimes the cell gets better after ketamine and sometimes the, the cells actually get, and if it gets better, we're tapping into the issue with depression. You know, ketamine is an antidepressant for you. So I, I am very excited about this, but I don't want to be overexcited and overreached. We really need to analyze that very carefully. Um, we see in some cells that they go to levels that they were higher than before, but um, I, I don't want to say, I don't have a good answer for you now. I, I know that they recover, but I don't want to, to overreach with that. Yeah, I thought I liked it. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Sure. Did that answer all your questions, Lindsay? Yeah, I'm sorry, I couldn't answer it, but I don't, I don't want to, to, to tell you something and they have to retract from that. I don't think that we have analyzed properly the tuning. So okay. Have, yeah, okay. Did, you, you. did you also use a, I believe it, you put sub non hallucinogenic or some yeah. type of. I think I think you kind of alluded to this. So like at very high doses, it can be anesthetic and then kind of like at a high dose, but sub anesthetic, there's a there's a point at which it becomes kind of hallucinogenic um, or uh, dissociative. And then at very low doses, that's where it's like sub hallucinogenic, sub anesthetic. And those are what the therapeutic doses are supposed to be. So I just wanted to kind of confirm that that was the area of dosing that you were using or if you were using a different dose. That, that's correct. So the, uh, the way that we did it, we titrated. Because as you say, it's, it's, we use this for anesthetizing the animal. So basically pre-surgery. Uh, and uh, we had to titrate that very well. And one of the things that we monitor when titrating them was uh, uh, one, the eye position. And the second thing that I didn't show you, there is a perceptual task in which we don't take the, away the, the, the object. And in the perceptual task, they have no problem. They go under the So the doses, the doses of ketamine were just enough, actually, to uh, not to get eye movement uh, tuned, not, not to get eye movement, because they start with nystagmus and they start with a lot of crazy stuff going on there. And actually, and the second thing is that perceptually, they can do the perceptual task. They can navigate toward the object, no problem. But when you put them in the working memory task, you see the depth. That was the dose that we reached. And I can send you, it's different for the two different animals. I can send you the manuscript. If you email me, uh, this manuscript is on the revision now. Uh, we can send you all the details. Yeah. I would love that. Thank you so much. We have another question from Jordan. It says, in the Duce et al. 2017 work, did you look at LFPs during the contextual Q period? 
This period seems critical for doing the task, and I'm wondering if there are any oscillatory signatures that relate to behavior. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's a good question. We're looking for uh, uh, short wave ripples during that oscillatory period. Now, when you do electrophysiology in macaques, you get very spoiled because your signal is so plain that when you look at the LFPs and they're not clean enough, then you say, I don't analyze that, that is not good enough. So I had like a lot of, uh, 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 I got robbed to do this analysis, he didn't want to do it. So I now have been doing this analysis, but yes, we see, we see sharp wave ripples during this period and they seem to be increasing, but also during the period when the animal goes back. I think that we see a lot of this spike uh, and this type of oscillatory activity when the animal gets a reward and it goes back and going back. And I think that what may be happening is that it's rehearsing this kind of uh, 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 activity, what happened during the trial. Now, we're doing this in humans too. We have humans doing exactly the same task in the OR, not in the OR, just our patients with epilepsy, different type of electrodes, different things, but that's all what we can look at because we cannot look at single units in these patients. And it seems to be that there is quite a bit of that there. Yes, especially when, when it is learning. So we can have also a learning curve for this task. Where you see the performance going up, and in this learning period, you can find a lot of oscillatory activity going on, especially short way ripples. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, and it looks like we are almost out of time, so let's just ask Tyler's last question. Could you speculate on the use of the persistent activity in MSTD? Is it related pursuit guidance or OKN? Yeah, um, uh, we did a choice probability analysis in MST and prefrontal. And what choice probability analysis gives you is whether the activity is related to behavior or not. So we did a, a, how, how much activity or to the decision of the animal, to the behavior of the animal. Uh, in MST was lower than in lateral prefrontal cortex. Nevertheless, was very robust the activity in MST too. So one of the ideas that we have, we have a large group now, a, a consortia that is called Neuronex, a work in memory. And what we're trying to do is to map exactly what is happening in areas like LIP or MST and the prefrontal. What is the difference between these two? And there is a few lesion studies. I think that Jackie Gottlieb did one study in which uh, they use Mossimol in prefrontal and they see the activity in LIP going down. I don't think that this has been done in MST. Uh, Diego Mendoza, he went to Bob Desimon lab and he's doing some of this experiment. He may have some answer to these questions. Uh, next, my speculation is that you do need MST activity in order to keep a better representation of the motion direction of the stimulus. But maybe the activity in MST needs actually this feedback from prefrontal areas to, uh, uh, um, to, be, to keep the activity active and to keep the representation actually sharp. That's my guess. Uh, what is exactly, exactly happening is it, hard to tell you, but that would be my, 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 my best theory here or hypothesis. Cool, thank you. Okay, well, if there are no other questions, then I think we can wrap this up. Thank you so much, um, Julio. That was an amazing talk. And I think now we're gonna go on to our trainee lunch. So thank you again. And uh, if you're not a trainee, thank you for coming. And uh, we'll see you next time on our next talk.